I stood up here a little bit early and everybody started getting quiet, so I kind of wandered away to let you know you had a few more minutes and then people started getting quiet, so I wandered back up here. I think it's time to start. We are going to be talking about Hezekiah still yet today. This will be our final class uh, covering Hezekiah. And in preparing for this class, if you looked at the, the reading list, there, there's um, one chapter in 2 Kings, a chapter and a half, not even that, barely a full chapter, honestly, in 2 Chronicles, and then two chapters in Isaiah. And really, there's not a whole lot of material. And I was thinking, man, Darrell, you could have put some more meat in this. And then I remembered I built the schedule several times ago. He just copied it, so it was nobody's fault but myself that uh, we had a little bit of material to cover tonight. But that does give us a chance to do uh, some review of some things uh, that I haven't either been here for when Nikki and I were traveling, and then uh, Sam uh, was able to catch us up on uh, Sunday, but a few things that he didn't get to either there. So we are, are definitely winding down the, our class period here, getting uh, to the last couple weeks. Uh, in fact, I am teaching uh, tonight, and then I will have um, in two and a half weeks the final class, uh, and we'll wrap that up uh, here as we approach the end of the books. So we are then, if we look at this timeline now, we've been Moving slowly down the timeline of the divided kingdom here. So today, we are going to be clearly in that time of Hezekiah and wrapping up the end of his reign there and looking at that uh, time period in, in the south. So Hezekiah, just as a very quick review, uh, that's what his name uh, looks like in Hebrew. Uh, more properly translated would, would be his kiahu and Google has a new thing. If you do Google Translate, you can actually put it in and it'll, it'll have a, like someone speaking in that foreign language so you can kind of hear it. It's kind of cool. Uh, but basically it means strengthened by God, which of course we, are, we know that Hezekiah is going to do that. Uh, he was the son of uh, Ahaz and uh, Abijah, or sometimes just called Abi in those two different spellings of uh, his mom's name are listed there. So overall, if you were to say, was Hezekiah a good king or a bad king, what would you say? Good, right? Okay. So 2 Kings chapter 18, it says, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And we know that he did several things. It says he removed the high places, he broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah, and he destroyed the bronze servant that Moses had made. Uh, and also from 2 Kings there, we find that he trusted in God. So uh, he held fast to God and to his commandments, even to the point of saying like his father uh, David had here. Then we see this sentence in 2 Kings when it goes about describing Hezekiah, where it reads, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, no among, nor among all of those who were before him. What kind of, what is that referring to when it says, there were no kings like him in Judah. What about David? What's that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, her comment was that this is talking about after the split, right? When there was Israel and Judah. Okay, you may remember that David never really reigned over Judah. I mean, I guess he did for a short time. He just ruled that tribe, uh, that and, and Benjamin for a little while there before he kind of took over the whole thing in his transition. Uh, but yet, it really is talking about that split. So literally, God is telling us here that in the entire divided kingdom period in the southern nation, Hezekiah was the best king. So it should give us something to look out here. And what was the result of that? Whenever we look at, you know, how things the kingdom gets stronger or weaker, a lot of times depending on the faithfulness of the king. If he was faithful, what do you think that probably meant for the kingdom? Sorry? Peaceful. Yeah, peaceful, generally, okay? There's some squabbles here, but generally peaceful. And even when they do go to war, what happens generally? They win, that's right, okay? So literally it tells us there, and the Lord was with him, and wherever he went out, he prospered. So whenever he went out to do things, in the nation they prospered, and whenever he went out to do things uh, 
even working with other nations, it tended to prosper here. Really, if you were going to summarize Hezekiah's reign, there are four main things that he did that are his primary achievements. He cleansed the temple. Remember, right away, very early, right? Finds they can't even get inside the temple when he becomes the king. So he, clean, he opens the doors, cleanses it, goes and finds all that. They find the book of the law, all that kind of good, happy stuff. Based on that then, he, when he finds the book of the law and reads it, he then tries to restore worship, okay? Restore it to the way it was supposed to be. Uh, we find that in 2 Chronicles 29. And that he celebrated the Passover or reinstituted the Passover, you may say sometimes here. Because it seems like the Passover hasn't properly been celebrated since the division, right? Okay. And then lastly, he organized or reorganized, maybe we would say the priesthood, to be more along the lines of what it was supposed to be according to the law there. And Darrell, I haven't had a chance, I completely forgot I could have gone back and watched his previous lessons when we were out, but uh, Darrell said he spent an entire time on Hezekiah's Passover, so I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that, Uh, just a few minutes, because this is actually one of my favorite passages in the entire Old Testament, because this really is the first true nationwide celebrated Passover, celebrated as it's supposed to be celebrated since the split of the two nations. However, what was true about this religious ceremony? Did they get all the details right? No, in fact, they got almost none of them right, right? It wasn't on the right day. They found maybe this little loophole for individuals who could who could celebrate the Passover on a different day, and they said, well, that means we can do it. They didn't have, the stuff wasn't consecrated correctly. The priests weren't consecrated correctly. They didn't have time to cleanse the temple and to get all of that kind of stuff ready. So not everything was exactly right. But Hezekiah makes this incredible prayer to God, which basically says, hey, we know we don't have it right, (laughs) but what are we doing? We're trying really hard, right? So forgive us if we don't get everything right. Look at our hearts. And if the people's hearts are right, then please accept this Passover, even though we don't get the details right. And what does God do? He agrees, okay? Now, I think this is a very important passage because it should give us a lot of hope, right? I mean, here were some people who knew They finally found the law, and when they read it, they said, oh, we can't do all of these things exactly right, but we're going to try really hard. And they approached God with humility, and what did God do? Yeah, he accepted it, right? Okay. But (laughs) some people will use Hezekiah's, God being um, accepting of Hezekiah's Passover, as well, those details then don't matter. Did Hezekiah say these details don't matter? No, he did not. What did he say? He said, we're going to get there, but this time what? (laughs) We just can't. We're trying, and we're going to try harder next time, but this time we just can't. Okay. So while I think that should give us some great comfort that God looks at our hearts, and if we are really trying our best, reading the scriptures and trying to do what we find there, if we don't get every detail right, I don't think you should be worried about that. (laughs) As long as you're what? Honestly trying, right? Is that an excuse to say, well, I can just do whatever I want? No, it's not, okay? It still said, what's that? That's a game. I'm sorry? That's a game. That's right. Yeah, some people play that game in their mind, right? Yeah. Well, I was really trying. You've got to forgive me. Well, were you really trying? Because what is God going to (laughs) know? Yeah, he's going to really know what was in your heart, right? Were you really trying? Were you doing the best you could? And if you're doing the best you you can, what's going to happen? Eventually, you're going to get it right, (laughs) right? Okay. And so I think that that that's a big thing about Hezekiah's Passover here. But once they celebrate that, it really rejuvenates all of Judah. They're now super excited. Hey, we can get back to worshiping God for the first time in in 100 years. We can do things right, and they they really get excited here. 
But during that time, one of the things that Darrell covered there was that Assyria kind of takes over for Syria. They become the major world power here now. And they actually, the northern kingdom, during Hezekiah's reign, what happens to it? Yeah, it falls. Completely goes away, right? So Assyria is going to come in and take Israel captive. The final king of the north, Hosea, he really brings it on himself. He thinks that he's more powerful than he is. And so he stops paying tribute to Assyria and decides, who can help me? Egypt, yeah. So he pays tribute to Egypt instead. That doesn't work out very well. So the siege of Samaria begins in in 720 BC, lasts approximately three years, so 720, 721, and into 722, whenever uh, Samaria falls. The entire northern kingdom is then taken away into captivity. And this map here you can see really kind of shows the three different waves that they're taken. So wave one, wave two, and then a little bit of wave three, but also some of the people who were living here were causing problems. So they got pushed even farther out to the east um, by the, the king of Assyria there. Some interesting points that I wanted to point out of that very quickly. Sam mentioned that we have some very strong historical references to this time period. Perhaps in all of the Old Testament, this is the period which we have the strongest and the most detailed uh, archaeological evidence for some of these things. Um, So Israel and the siege of Samaria being under attack, we have actually found uh, steels like this, which show uh, a city... may very well be Samaria. There was no labels, but other than this was the taking of Israel by Assyria. And you can see that a bunch of uh, Hebrews are being taken captive. And actually, I don't know how well I don't have my glasses on. You can see that detail, but it's even to the point of the beards and the hats that they were wearing as, as Jews at that time are depicted in this, um, a Syrian uh, piece of artwork, and it shows them taking not only people, and this picture is a little bit cropped, but taking herds and all those kind of things. And this person up here, it has his hands bound. He's being taken uh, as a slave, not as uh, a captive here. Another uh, urn that was found that shows some of the taking of uh, some of the towns in uh, Israel here. We can see, of course, uh, Assyria being the world power at the time, very heavy into the use of chariots. And it's interesting that this goes even to talk about the knocking down of the walls like we find in the Bible, where there's a ram on the end of the chariot and it shows the guy falling off the wall. I don't know why I like these. I think they're, they're pretty cool. And then this one here, one of the things that um, the Assyrians were extremely well known for was their cruelty and the way that they did battle. So this is, again, attacking a city in Israel. We're not exactly sure which city it is, but it is a city in Israel that was being taken. And there's some things here that, that actually scholars didn't know Assyrians did until they started finding some of these things. Um, and off the picture here uh, is some more of someone being hanged, just like these people up here are being impaled. And the thing that's about that is if this is the city wall, What they would do to terrorize the people inside of the city is anyone that had been captured or those who had been running away or even just the the farmers in the countryside that they captured, they would put these very gruesome displays of, hey, if you don't surrender and we have to take the city, this is what's going to happen to you. Just terrible, gruesome displays. And then also, this was found, I always thought this was pretty interesting. In the early 1900s, they found uh, a city that was attacked People thought it was by the Assyrians there in Israel. And one of the things was a ramp had been built up to the wall with um, earth so that they could move a siege engine up close to the wall uh, and try to knock it down. And there were a bunch of bodies found inside that, that hill. Well, come to find out, that is one of the things in 1950 or so when this was found, they found that it actually depicted, so here's the city wall, Here's that siege engine being rolled up the hill. And how did they build that hill? By throwing the bodies of dead soldiers into the hill. 
So pretty interesting. And all of this is very clearly marked as happening in Israel, Assyria attacking Israel uh, up in the north. When we talk about the fall of Samaria, then of course, it says, so the people were taken from their homeland and exiled into Assyria, and they are still there. Uh, that's when that, it was being written there. And actually, we find this steel that describes that of the people being taken away. And here's another image of some Jewish people being carried away by Assyrian soldiers into captivity. And actually, it mentions there in that steel how many cities were taken, uh, including uh, Samaria, and directly kind of lays out the Assyrian campaign against Israel, which exactly matches the biblical story. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. So the Assyrians, over time, we can see that they really started up in the north here. So if we talk about, you know, Palestine, Syria, Assyria, and Babylon area over here. So Assyria started up in this area, took over most of the northern part of the Fertile Crescent. And by the time we get to the period that we're in now, whenever this, the, when Judah is under siege from them, uh, they have pretty much controlled all of this except for that tiny little bit that Judah was still an independent country there. Uh, other than that, they even controlled down into and attacked all the way down into Egypt. So then we've started talking about some of the relationship between Assyria and Judah. Of course, one of the reasons that Judah was allowed to be an independent country was they had a treaty. Uh, so Ahaz, uh, the king of, of Judah, had paid to help with Syria and Israel. So uh, when Syria and Israel were attacking Judah, Ahaz sent a bunch of money up to Assyria to say, hey, help us out. You attack them from behind. And so they had this treaty started. And we actually know that Ahaz, once they started doing that, and Tilgath Pleaser, who was one of the kings of Assyria, took Syria and captured Damascus, which was the headquarters of Syria. Ahaz went up there to meet him and to kind of secure their trade, their treaty, we find. But of course, one of the things we talked about and Sam talked about is what about Hezekiah? Does Hezekiah agree that they should be kind of this vassal state to Assyria? No, he did what? God was prospering him and God was giving him some early victories, so he decides what? I can rebel, right? Okay. So he says, I won't pay tribute or serve anymore. And Sam covered this in uh, 2 Kings 18, verse 7, uh, how some of those early successes gave Hezekiah that confidence. However, Assyria decides, well, we're not having any of that. <laughs> You're just this tiny little country. We're going to come squash you like a bug. And so they begin to head down there, uh, 1 Kings 18, 13, 2 Chronicles 23, 1, and Isaiah chapter 36. Verse 1 really begins the description of Assyria moving in to attack Israel here. And they capture some key cities in Judah, the most important one being uh, Lachish, so Lachish was the second most important and the second most fortified city in all of Judah at this time. And it really becomes that staging point. If you can take Lachish, it's kind of that fortress on the northern border there that then the floodgates are kind of open and you can come pretty easily in to attack the rest of Judah. Isaiah chapter 36 verses 1 to 2 reads, Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them, including the city of Lachish, as mentioned there. So the siege of Lachish, actually, uh, we have found that depicted on some wall plates in Nineveh here. So you can see just the scale of some of those drawings that have, have survived all the way uh, from then and have been found. Uh, here's kind of a, a zoom in of some of those, those pictures here. Again, just showing you know, all kinds of captives being taken, showing the way uh, you may recognize even, I mean, obviously it's similar artists, but that same kind of siege engine rolling up a hill made of dirt and bodies. I mean, it just that... That thing was repeated, what they were doing in Israel. Now they continued to do down in Judah whenever they took Lachish. 
So because Lachish was so big, it's actually documented in three different places that we have found so far um, in some uh, Assyrian relics there, that siege of Lachish. Uh, Sennacherib then went on to s- describe some of the exiles that he took from Lachish. He counted uh, men and women and uh, herds and things that he took captive there, and he very clearly had that put out as one of his victory urns uh, that would uh, just this great big urn that they found that, that tells the entire story of um, the building of Lachish. And that brings up a question that I've had some people ask me before. Why is it so common that we find things like this on pottery? Well, what did they have to work with mostly? (laughs) Pottery, right? Mud and and earth. And so it really became that when they would make those wall plates, you know, there wasn't a lot of carving of stone that detailed, okay? So one of the ways that you could keep some very detailed records, one of the ways you could make some very detailed artwork is when you're making pottery, when it's in that state before you fire it, it's very soft, it's very pliable, and they could very easily carve in that. That's why so many of these relics we find are urns and pots and things like that. You think, why would they put that on a pot? Well, they didn't cook out of it. It was a thing that was made to say, look at our great victory here. Okay, uh, one last thing uh, that he spelled out was his cruelty to captives, uh, as we find described here, including the tortures that they did. Uh, They didn't bother to hide that. Uh, And one of the things that this um, graph depicts is, again, just showing the cruelty, uh, shows some of the men being tortured. And again, these are Jews. Uh, You can tell by the way their hair and their beards are depicted uh, is similar to all the rest of the Jews. And so these men are being tortured while their wife, wives and children are, are forced to watch. So overall, the Assyrians, really bad dudes. <laughs> okay, really, really uh, bad people that you want them to fall into, uh, to fall into problems with them. Just some other things that we find. This is a good time to talk about Judah in secular history because it happens around this time. Uh, We've already mentioned a couple times the Sennacherib. uh, He made several things, one of which was this clay prism that he had built with all of this writing in three different languages on there. Uh, Very similar to, we've all probably heard of the Rosetta Stone, right, where we used that to translate some languages. If you know one, you can kind of figure out the other two. Very similar here with Sennacherib. He had this entire prism uh, built. I think this only has two languages on it, though, if I remember right. Uh, it was found in Nineveh. Tells completely of his siege of Jerusalem. Uh, Sennacherib boasts that he shut up Hezekiah the Judahite. It literally says Hezekiah the Judahite. Uh, within Jerusalem, uh, his own royal city like a caged bird, it talks about there. Uh, One of the interesting things is it says of this great victory he won, Lachish, and how then he moved in and surrounded Jerusalem, had Hezekiah all penned up, but never what? Never took the city. It doesn't mention that at all. Now, it also doesn't mention the defeat. (laughs) It doesn't say, hey, we lost that battle. It just says we went down and we penned him up like this caged bird. One of the things that I've always found interesting is the Bible repeatedly is criticized as a historical document. And in some ways that's correct because was the Bible given to us to be a history book? No. But guess what? It is also a history book, right? And it tells a lot of history. And so for years and years and years, people who have tried to discredit the Bible have gone in search of these kind of things. And in fact, for a long time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, what was the primary purpose for a lot of the excavations that were sent to Palestine? It was to try to disprove the Bible story. But what happened every single time they find something? It, it tends to prove the Bible story. Amazing. And it's always funny how when people will read the Bible and say, even kings, like we see here, this list of kings, well, that's not real history. But then as soon as we go dig up some clay prism that mentions Hezekiah, now all of a sudden what? Oh, he must have been real, right? 
Okay, it's just kind of funny to me. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this is, like we mentioned, one of three places that we know uh, that the conquest of Judah uh, was laid out there. Interesting note here also, um, the Egyptian records tell of Sennacherib's defeat in Judah. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting story. If you read through that, it talks about Assyria coming down to fight Judah with this, uh, to fight Egypt with this great big army that's going to come through, and they're, as they're moving their way through what happens to be Judah, um, this story gives uh, credit to one of the Egyptian gods for sending an entire plague of mice to go attack the army, and that plague of mice chewed all the bowstrings, chewed all the bottoms out of their quivers, and all of the the leather plates that you wrap a shield to your arm with, they chewed all them so they didn't have any bows and they had no shields and so they couldn't fight and they went home. That's the whole story of why uh, the Assyrian army never made it to Egypt. Uh, of course, we know that's not exactly what happened there. Um, we find in 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, Sam talked about this a little bit on Sunday, and it came to pass that a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed the camp of the Assyrians, 185,000, and when the people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. So Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home and remained at Nineveh, and just has been, has been prophesied. Now when it came to pass that when he was worshiping the temple of Nirosh his god, that his sons Adramelech and Sherezar struck him down with the sword, and they escaped in the land of Erat, and then uh, Ereshardon his son reigned in his place. Um, we, I don't know what that is. Um, there is this, it's called the Nabonidus steel, so just another thing made out of clay, a plaque that would have been put on the wall here, uh, and it describes exactly what happened here. So it's a basalt steel uh, that records the assassination of Sennacherib by his sons in 681 BC. This claims that it was as a rebuke because of the consequences. The Assyrian god Marduk got mad because uh, Sennacherib went and destroyed Babylon. And so because he destroyed Babylon, the Babylonian god uh, came in and, and had his sons kill him. It's just interesting that even to the name of the sons, it matches exactly what we have in the Bible. All right, now that I spent 25 minutes talking about what I wasn't supposed to talk about, <laughs> we've got 20 minutes to talk about uh, our, our class for today. So really, our entire class for today is talking about two topics that we find. That is the last two events that we have recorded about Hezekiah's life. One is he's going to get sick, and the other one is he's going to have some visitors. And these are really some pretty straightforward stories, which is why we don't uh, really need a lot of time to talk about them. So Hezekiah's story of getting ill is found in all three of the books that record this time period here. So it's in 2 Kings chapter 20, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, and in the entire chapter of uh, Isaiah chapter 38 is dedicated to this. So Hezekiah gets sick. What kind of sickness? Yeah, we don't know what kind of sickness, but we know what. It was fatal, mortal, that's right, okay? So we don't really know what it is, but we do find out, and Second Chronicles is the only one that really tells us this, that the reason he got sick is God is mad at him. <laughs> because of all of the great things that God has allowed Hezekiah to do, Hezekiah has not given back. Uh, he has not been thankful enough to God because of that, and he has had a lot of pride of his own accomplishments. So because of that, God sends this sickness on him, and apparently it's a little bit confusing, but uh, it also mentions that all of Jerusalem is suffering under his wrath. Okay, So whether that means a bunch of people in Jerusalem got sick also, was it some kind of plague? We don't really know, uh, and especially because that's all that it really mentions about there is that one brief, brief mention in Second Chronicles. But he's sick, and if you're sick in the Bible, especially if you're a king, what do you, who do you want to go talk to? Call for a prophet, right? Because what might happen? He might heal you. Okay, so, of course, that's what happens. He calls out, and God also sends Isaiah to Hezekiah here. And Hezekiah is hoping for some good news. <laughs> hey, 
don't worry about it, God's going to heal you, you've been a good king. But instead, what does uh, Isaiah tell him? Yeah, you're going to die. You better get your house in order, he says, right? Because you're going to die, and you're going to die right quick here, okay? So he tells him that the sickness is fatal, and then in true Isaiah fashion, just, I mean, I never knew the guy, obviously, uh, but, you know, just from what you read about him, you kind of get a bit of glimpse of his, his character, very much lay it on the line, and then that's it, right? So he walks in, and he tells him, ah, you're going to die, and then he does what? He starts to leave. That's right. He starts to walk out. Doesn't wait for a response. Nothing. Just boom. He turns and he starts to walk out here. Okay. Now, Hezekiah, of course, it appears from the, the language, it appears Hezekiah is laying in his sick bed. Uh, and, and when uh, Isaiah comes to see him, and as soon as Isaiah says, hey, you're going to die. God says you're going to die here. Hezekiah actually has a great thought, which is what? Pray to God. That's right. I tried to go to the prophet, and that didn't work out, so now where am I going to go? Well, let's go up another level, and let's go to the big boss, okay? So he repents. It says he immediately, I said, rolls over. It says immediately he what? Faced the wall, right? So it really seems to be he's laying in his bed, and Isaiah walks out, and he rolls over, facing the wall, and starts to cry and has this prayer out to God to save him. And we're told he really humbles himself here, okay? Kind of lays it on the line and, you know, and says, I'm, I'm sorry, and you've done these great things for me, and, you know, I didn't give you that. And, and he reminds God that, hey, I've been a good king. I've served you. I even served you wholeheartedly. I just maybe forgot to be thankful here, okay? And what's God's response? Does it take a long time for God to respond? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So first of all, the the thing that's interesting to me is it's so quick, Isaiah hasn't even had time to leave the palace. So he told him, you're going to die. He turns around and starts to leave. And before he gets out of the house, even, it says he made it to the mid court. Before he even gets out of the house, what does God say? Well, go back. (laughs) That's right. Go back and tell him, hey, you're going to live here. Okay. So Isaiah gets sent right back to Hezekiah, and he tells him three things here. One of those three things that Isaiah tells him is going to happen. So you're going to get better, right, was one. And does he give a time frame for that? Three days. In three days, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going to be well enough to leave the house and go into the temple of God and and to worship here, okay? So you're on your deathbed, you're dying, but in three days, it's all going to be better, okay? And by the way, and I think somebody already mentioned it, not only am I going to let you live right now, I'm going to guarantee you another what? Another 15 years, okay? That's right. So I'm going to give you another 15 years onto your life. And also, because we find that passage in, in 2 Chronicles that talked about Jerusalem also being under the wrath. Actually, all three versions record that part of the message to Hezekiah, what else is going to happen? Yeah, the, the, God's going to protect the city right here. So he says, and I'll still watch over Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be saved here. Okay. So all three things. If there ever was an example of, in the Bible, the power of prayer, this is a great example of God proclaiming you're going to die, and then through a prayer, very heartfelt, I mean, I can't imagine being told you're going to die being more heartfelt than that, but he immediately pours his whole heart out to God, and God relents, and right away sends Isaiah back to go and tell him the good news here. Interestingly enough, though, like we see several times in the Bible, Sometimes God just speaks and things happen, right? But sometimes there's like a remedy given or a way God says to fix this. Think about like even when they were leaving Egypt and they come to this, you know, Mara, right? The bitter water. God could have just said, well, now here it's clean. But instead he told them what? Go cut down these trees and throw it in the water and that will make it clean. Same thing happens here. Even though Isaiah tells him, you're going to get better, and in three days you're going to go worship and all that kind of stuff. He tells the people how to fix it, okay? He provides the remedy for the sickness here. 
And I don't know of what sickness this cures. I don't think it probably is, really. John, you can tell me if boiling figs and breathing in those fumes, I don't know of any disease that cures. But that's what he tells them to do. Go get this cake of figs, and you boil some water next to him, and you put these figs in that water, and that's what's going to help him recover here. Now, in reality, was it the boiling of the figs that saved him? No. Just like Naaman going into the Jordan River and dipping seven times, the Jordan River didn't heal him. What did? Yeah, the obedience did. That's right, exactly. So whenever Hezekiah here becomes back faithful to God and the people that are taking care of him do what Isaiah says here, that is really what cures him. But it is interesting that, that it actually lays out what the remedy was to boil some figs. I don't Kind of a strange thing there. But Hezekiah, he's one of these great character studies where it says he was this great king and all these kind of things, but then he doesn't even believe it. Okay, he says, well, okay, you told me first I was going to die. Now you tell me I'm going to live. So I need some kind of sign that this is really going to happen here. Okay, he wants this reassurance because he knows now that Isaiah's told him he's going to live, what's Isaiah going to do? He's going to turn around and walk right back out. So before Isaiah leaves, he says, hey, wait a minute. You've got to give me some kind of sign I can look for so that I know all of this is going to happen. So Isaiah lays out the sign. There is a sundial that is in the middle of the court, and the shadow of that sundial is going to move, which guess what happens every single day? The shadow of that sundial moves, okay? So, Isaiah asks him, hey, what do you want for a sign? God is going to do something to that sundial. Do you want him to make it jump 10 steps forward? Or do you want to make it jump 10 steps back? Now, Isaiah, uh, Hezekiah, he's a pretty smart guy. And he thinks to himself, well, what happens every day? The shadow gets longer, Right? So for God to make the shadow get longer, that's not really much of a miracle. I want the shadow to do what? To go back the other way here, okay? So he actually says it's an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen. Let it go backwards or descend. Some of your versions may say the shadow descended. Um, basically, what is he saying? Yeah, turn back the clock, right? Okay, literally 10 hours, that's what we think that steps mean. It may not, it may just literally be that it covered 10 steps in the courtyard, but scholars tend to think that he's saying, let it go back 10 hours worth of time, okay? So Isaiah promises that that will be what happened, and guess what? It happens, okay? So it happens, Hezekiah gets his sign, and then only in the book of Isaiah do we find this, about half of that chapter in Isaiah is this writing of Hezekiah, which is basically, I was a worm, I was a bad guy, and I was going to die, and what did God do? He saved me, okay? I was stuck going into the depths of Sheol, I wasn't even going to see anybody else anymore, and God came down and saved me. So he has this great uh, statement here. And again, that's only recorded in the book of um, Isaiah. So now Hezekiah recovers. And remember, what was the reason that this sickness came on him? His, yeah, his pride and his unthankfulness, right? He thought it was all because of him. Well, guess what's going to happen again? <laughs> He's going to get caught up by his pride, Okay, so like so many of us, Hezekiah's primary problem here really does seem to be his, pride, his uh, downfall here. So God continues to bless Hezekiah for a period here, and he continues to win battles again, and he actually becomes very, very wealthy here. We're told about how much silver, I mean, it doesn't list it out like it did for Solomon, but he has excess silver and gold for shields and for ornaments, and he has all these flocks, and he rebuilt all these cities. It even seems to be like some of the languages he built some of his own cities, which 
typically we translate as like a retreat or something for the king to go to. Uh, today, our modern version would be like Camp David, right? Where, where the king can go. Um, so it mentions all these things that describes how wealthy he becomes. So then we're going to get these envoys from Babylon. And really, this is the first time in this story we're going to hear about this place called Babylon. It's going to have a major impact later on, we know, but this is really one of the first mentions of it that we see here. And so the king of Babylon sends these envoys to uh, talk to Hezekiah. And the purpose of them coming seems a little bit confusing. In two of the books, in Kings and Isaiah, it says that the, the king of Babylon sent people to Hezekiah because they had heard that he had been sick. Okay, so they heard he'd been really sick and he had recovered. So they send some political envoys to go talk to him. Uh, in Chronicles, we find that it says that they came to inquire about the sign that had been done. Apparently, that 10 hours going backwards wasn't just felt in uh, Judah, right? It seems like God may have turned back 10 hours for the whole world, perhaps at this time, because they know this sign. They hear the stories about all these strange things coming out of, out of Israel here. And, and I think it's not really confusing to read those different passages, because those, those two events happened at the same time, right? He got sick and recovered, and that miracle happened as the sign here, Okay. But really, what this is, is this is a diplomatic visit from a growing kingdom. At this time, Babylon is not a world power. They are growing. They have been smashed by Assyria, but are starting to rebuild here. So Hezekiah greets these envoys, and because Hezekiah seems to be a, a bit full of himself here, he, he takes them in, apparently with no reservations. And so God decides, and again, we only find this in one of the passages, God decides, I'm not going to tell him what to do. I'm going to sit back and see what happens. Literally, it says, God left him to himself in order to test him and to know all that was in his heart. So here's this guy who was extremely prideful. I told him he was going to die. He repents. He offers all these thanksgiving, and he says, I'm a worm. And so then I heal him. Well, let's see, did that really take? But what really happened to Hezekiah's pride? Then didn't go away here, okay? So despite the humility he showed when facing death, his pride returns here. And so he takes these envoys and shows them all around. We find there it says, And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil, his whole armory, and all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all of his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Literally, you couldn't get a better definition of someone who's proud and wants to show off, right? Okay. Why is that a terrible idea? Yeah. <laughs> you take this guy from another kingdom and you say, look how rich I am. What's he going to think? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe I can have some of that, right? He's going to go back home and he's going to tell the people in Babylon, if we got money problems, what do we need to do? <laughs> yeah, go rob them. They got a lot of it, okay? So just from a purely secular viewpoint, it's a stupid thing to do here, okay? But of course, God doesn't like it because he's just being prideful again. So he sends Isaiah back to him. Isaiah asks, hey, who are those guys? Hezekiah doesn't hesitate to tell him. Oh, they were people from Babylon. And guess what I did? I showed them everything. And Isaiah even says, how much did you show them? And he says, oh, I showed them it all. So of course, this terrible doom is pronounced now upon Hezekiah. God is not going to reverse the 15 years that he gave him, but all of the riches that he has and all of the riches that have been stored up from all the beginning of the kings of Israel, what's going to happen? They're going to be taken to where? To Babylon, okay? Even some of your sons are going to be taken away, and not only are they going to be taken away, but they're going to be made eunuchs, and they're going to have to serve in the court of the king of Babylon. Now, I said before that Isaiah's statement of, hey, I took him around, I showed him everything I had, seems to be very prideful and kind of self-centered, right? Man, you ain't seen nothing yet. Because how does Hezekiah take the news? He has this, I mean, I almost can't even believe his response. The prophet of God who just 
told you you're going to die and then you're going to get healed and you're going to have this miraculous, the sun's going to go backwards for 10 hours. He comes and says, Jerusalem's going to be taken. Your sons are going to be made eunuch. And Hezekiah says, oh, the word of the Lord is good. What? What is good about that? What's good about everything's going to be taken and your sons are going to be captured? What, what, what's that? Yeah, Hezekiah says, well, what did God promise me? 15 more years. Oh, this is a good word because he doesn't say it's going to happen to me. He says it's going to happen to my sons. Man, you talk about maybe the most self-centered guy that I've ever read of in the Bible here, right? Okay, so terrible, terrible. As good as Hezekiah was, some of his actions here at the end of his reign really don't paint a very good picture of him. Um, uh, I got this on there. So later... We're not told anything else about Hezekiah after this, other than later he dies and his son Manasseh rules in his place. All right. That is the end of Hezekiah. Yes, sir. It, it does seem to be. Um, I don't remember how old it says Manasseh was when he took over, but it talks about his sons that have been born since then, so it may very well be. But I don't remember. Does anybody? I mean, it probably says in the next chapter. He was what? Manasseh was 12 years old. He was 12 years old. That's right. Yeah. I, I couldn't remember the exact age, but 12 years old. So yes, definitely one of the later sons after that, that 15 years was granted. All right. Thank you.